Okay, so now we're driving up the road, up the hill. It's a very short drive. They drive up and down at night as well, of course, but they're not allowed to turn their full headlights on, just the parking lights, because uh, I'm sure you can guess why they don't, they're not allowed to turn their lights on. And they also have to drive pretty slowly, obviously. Here we go. You can't always do this. You can't do this later on, but today, because it's the morning, we can drive right up next to them. Okay, everyone, this is UT4. It's the first one we're going to go inside. And for people who've seen pictures of the VLT before, this might be the one you recognise most, because this is the one that shoots that laser at the top in all those famous pictures. Hopefully we'll talk about the laser later. But for now, all being well, we'll show you inside the telescope. Okay, so here we are inside UT4. It's pretty big, as you'd expect. There's the telescope. But before we talk about all that, let's talk a bit about what it feels like in here. It's actually very cool inside the telescope, and that's because it's air conditioned, and the air conditioning has been set, bearing in mind the forecast for tonight's weather, so that when they open up, the air in here is already a similar temperature to the air outside, which is very important in astronomy. The noises you hear, well, you hear the air conditioning, and you also hear that compressor noise you hear in so many telescopes, which is used to cool the liquid nitrogen, which in turn is used with the instruments, which we'll talk about in a minute. But let's have a, uh, let's have a little walk around. Yeah, so they have uh, four 8.2 metre telescopes. They've basically, there was a, uh, a cone-shaped mounting which they cut the top off, flattened it. And they basically flattened it off, uh, blew it up, and then they erected four large telescopes on that summit, all identical. The European Southern Observatory's approach to these things tends to be to do the job properly. And there's pluses and minuses to doing the job properly, which is that actually when you do the job properly it costs a lot because actually you really want to make sure everything works absolutely the way it's supposed to work and you don't bodge things, you really design things to the nth degree. The plus side from a professional astronomer's point of view is that it all works and so actually when you come to use the telescopes they have very well defined modes of operation, you know exactly what you're going to get, you don't have to try and bodge things together because really the telescopes behave the way they were designed to behave. We see the, the dome there and well the telescope there. Now I think to get a better look at the telescope we might go up a level. So we've got Laura still here with us, she's going to show us the way. We're both wearing hard hats like you do inside the domes. So we can see over there, well the, basically the aperture will open this way. And then you see those shutters over there, they're sort of windshields that open up as well. So when the light can come in, it's going to come in down there and hit the mirror. We can see the mirror under there, if Brady focuses his camera. 8.2 metres. That is a big mirror. That is a very big mirror. So the light comes in and hits that and then bounces up there. You can see it. There's our secondary. And then there's better. We've moved around. This is better here, as I was saying primary, secondary, and then tertiary. That's the third one down there. I'll show you that later when I change the lens again. And then depending on what they've done with the tertiary, the light can go off to the two nasmiths on the side. We've got two instruments. One there called Hawkeye, which we'll see in a minute. And then we've got Nako. And down the bottom, we've got Symphony. So they can use either of those three depending on what they want to do. While we're upstairs we'll look at the the instruments on the Nesmith. One of the entertaining things about telescopes is whenever we build a new telescope or, or you know put in a bid to build a new telescope you always write you know a science case as to what it is this telescope is actually going to do and the interesting thing is when you come to look back at those science cases you know after the telescope is actually built Almost always the things that you thought were going to be interesting turned out not to be particularly interesting, but also always the telescope goes on to do really excellent things. This was even true with the Hubble Space Telescope. I went and looked back in the, the 1970s where they wrote a science case for the Hubble Space Telescope. Turns out all the things they thought were going to be interesting 
turned out either not to be interesting or they just don't work. But of course, the Hubble Space Telescope's gone on to do excellent things. And the same is true with the VL VLTs, right? There were things that it was designed to do. But really, it's a workhorse, right? It's just a, an instrument. And you can point it at anything you want to point it at. And so because it has these very sort of general purpose instruments, that essentially means that you can do science that wasn't even thought of when the telescopes were being built. Um, just because the subject's moved on, but the instruments are still there to do the science with. This giant light bucket will give you a focused image of the uh, galaxy or the star or whatever it is you're studying, and then you need to analyse that light some way. Do you want to take an image of it? In which case you just put a detector, a camera, like a digital camera, or whatever, uh, on, onto the focus. Do you want to split the light up into its component uh, wavelengths and study the composition and the kinematics and the, the, the velocities in the, in the material in the star of the galaxy, then you take put a spectrograph on the uh, focus. And there's many more advanced things you can do as well. You can sharpen the image with adaptive opti optics, you can look at the polarization of the light, you, you can do all sorts of things. You can look at infrared light, you can look at optical light. So each one of those things requires a different instrument. No single instrument will, will do everything. Each instrument tends to work in a particular wavelength range and will either do imaging or do spectroscopy. And the amount of detail that you get in the spectrum or the image will also vary from instrument to instrument. So there's a, there's, what's required at the modern observatory is a, is a wide array of different instruments to, to cover all the parameter space that you might wish to explore. So we're off on one of the sides here, the NASMUTH. And this instrument is NACO. And they're very proud of it at ESO because in 2004, and then confirmed in 2005, it was NACO using infrared light that gave the first direct detection of an exoplanet. Not using all the indirect methods we know about and we've seen in previous videos, but actual light from the planet itself, detected by this instrument bolted onto the side of this telescope. So a little bit of history here and one of the real proud achievements of ESO. They're really pleased about it. And that's... That's what did it. Pretty cool. Let's continue around the dome. You get a bit of a clearer view over this side of the dome. Now we're, we're on the opposite side to where we came in. You can see there the disc, the azimuth, that lets them turn the telescope around 360 degrees. And it's holding everything up as well. I'm told it's sort of in the ballpark of 450 tonnes. You're looking at 747 jet type mass held up by that disc there that rotates the whole thing. And I'll tell you what, when it rotates, it's like a feather touching silk. It's so smooth and so quiet, it's amazing. Of course, it's not doing anything at the moment because it's the middle of the day. And if it was the middle of the night, there's no chance they'd let me in here. Really good look at the mirror there. I'll change lens in a minute and show you that mirror even better. So we're coming around to the other side now, the other Nazimuth, the other direction they can channel the light off to. And here we have the instrument Hawkeye, which I think is a really cool name. No offence to Symphony and NACO, but I think Hawkeye is a much cooler name. I don't know if it's a cooler instrument, but it's a better name. It's a bit darker around this side. You can hear the compressor. Laura's just pointed out we're really close now to the shutter and all these windshields here. I, like last night I did a time lapse, so I'd be able to show you that footage. These all open one by one. So first of all, that opens. And once that's open, the main aperture, up the top there, then all these open, if the wind conditions are all right, presumably. We've almost done the full 360. So here we are, pretty much back to where we started. Let's go down the bottom and look at a couple more things. It was there kind of early, and, and it is true that actually getting your telescope built sooner means that you can kind of pick off the easy science that you can only do with a bigger telescope. Um, but even now, you know, there aren't that many telescopes of that size in the world and there's an awful lot of universe out there. So there's still plenty for it to do, plenty of new observations to make. So the whole cell and mirror together there, you're looking at 45 tonnes. The mirror itself on its own is 23 tonnes. Now, that poses a few problems I'm sure you can imagine. One of them is the fact that as you tip the mirror through the night to look at different angles of the sky, gravity starts to affect the mirror and deform it ever so slightly. So what you do is you have something called active optics, which are, see all those little pistons there? There's 150 actuators, basically little pistons that can push and pull the shape of the mirror 
so that it maintains always this hyperbolic shape as it's slewing around the sky. All the time, just minor little adjustments, a little tweak here, a little tweak there, fighting against gravity, which itself is fighting against that huge mirror. So I, I use it to observe, uh, I've mostly used it to observe um, nearby galaxies, but to observe stars in those galaxies, to actually particular hot, bright stars in those galaxies. So things which are you know, maybe five million light years away, that's quite a far away, that's quite close by for a galaxy, but it's quite far away for a star. Here's the final instrument, Symphony. Now this is not a, na a Nazmuth, the Nazmuths are the two sides. This is the Cassegrain focus here. Oh, there it is. Spelt differently to what I thought. Now one of the other really cool things about UT4, as opposed to the other three domes, is UT4 fires this laser into the sky. And we'll talk more about it later. We'll probably put it into a different video. But here, down here, under Hawkeye actually, is the uh, Laser Guide Star Facility where they create it and the laser goes up. You can see that little bit of rig there. I think the uh, cable goes up there, up to the top, and then the laser gets fired up out the top, up into the atmosphere. So we've just come out of UT4, and now, we seem to be doing these in descending order today. We're going to go and have a look at UT3.